So I will speak in English, even if my English is not uh, very, very good. But uh, because some of uh, girls will be uh, are English speak spoken, so I will continue. But for for the others, I suppose uh, we will have a mixed discussions and if someone wants to say something or to expose some topics uh, i will be very thankful and um, so uh, today um, i would like only to to speak um, something of it to read Sleeping Beauty, Charles Perrault, a ta fairy tale, because everything hides with it's kind of nice to, that you are here. <laughs> so, you, we, we all know now that everything is closed, that, uh, that everything is more introvert uh, in somehow. So, it reminds me really the Sleeping Beauty uh, effect, but everybody was uh, frozen in one moment, and uh, how how long it will take, and we don't know really. But uh, it is some similar situation somehow. So I will read the original of it. not not original, but uh, in. Uh, English tr translation of Perrault fairy tale Sleeping Beauty um, and so on. <laughs> so, once upon a time there was a king and a queen who were very sorry that they had no children, so sorry that it cannot be told. At last, however, the queen had a daughter. There was a very fine christening, and the princess had for her good manners all the fairies they could find in the whole kingdom. There were seven of them, so that every one of them might confer a gift upon her, as was the custom of the fairies in, the, in those days. By this means, the princess had all the perfections imaginable. After the christening was over, the company returned to the king's palace, where was prepared a great feast for the fairies. There was placed before every one of them a magnificent cover with a case of massive gold, wherein were a spoon and a knife and a fork, all of pure gold set with diamonds and rubies. But as they were all sitting down at the table, they saw a very old fairy come into the hall. She had not been invited, because for more than fifty years she had not been out of a certain tower, and she was believed to be either dead or enchanted. The king ordered her a cover, but he could not give her a case of gold, as the others had, because seven only had been made for seven fairies. The old fairy fancied she was lighted and muttered trees between her feet. One of the young fairies who stood near heard her and, judging that she might give the little princess her unlucky gift, hid herself behind the curtains as soon as they left the table. She hoped that she might speak last and undo as much as she could the evil which the old fairy might do. In the meanwhile, all the fairies began to give the gifts to the princess. The youngest gave her for her gift that she could that should should be the most beautiful person in the world. The next that she could have the weight of an angel. The third that she could be to, able to do everything she did gracefully. The fourth that she could dance perfectly. The fifth that she could sing like a nightingale, and a sister, that she could play all kinds of musical instruments to the fullest perfection. 
The old fairy's turn coming next, her head shaking more with the spider than with the age. She said that the princess should pierce her head with a spindle and die after wa- of the wound. This terrible gift made the whole company tremble, and everybody fell a crying. All this very instant the young fairy came from behind the curtains and said his words in a loud voice. Assure yourselves, O king and queen, that your daughter shall not die of this disaster. It is true, I have no power to undo entirely what my elder has done. The princess shall indeed pierce her hand with a spindle, but instead of dying, she shall only fall into a deep sleep, which shall last a hundred years, at the end of which a king's son shall come and awake her. The king, to avoid the misfortune foretold for the old fairy by the old fairy, issued orders forbidding at anyone of pain of death, on pain of death, to spin with a distaff on spindle, or to have a spindle in his house. About fifteen or sixteen years after, the king and queen being absent under one of their country villas. The young princess was one day running up and down the palace. She went the room from room to room, and at last she came into a little garret on the top of the tower where the goat, goat old woman alone was spinning with her spindle. This good woman has never heard of the king's orders against spindles. What are I doing there, my good woman? said the princess. I spin, my pretty child, said the old woman, who did not know who the princess was. Ha, said the princess, this is very pretty. How do you do it? Give it to me. Let me see if I can do it. She had no sooner taken it into her hand, and, either because she was too quick and headless, or because the decree of the fairy has had so ordained, it ran into her hand and she fell down into a swoon. The good old woman, not knowing what to do, cried out for help. People came in from every quarter. They threw water upon the face of her princess, unlaced her, struck her on the palms of her hands and rubbed her temples with the cologne water but nothing would bring her to herself. Then the king, who came up at hearing the noise, remembered that the fairies had foretold. He knew very well that this must come to pass, since the fairies had foretold it, and he caused the princess to be carried into, thank you, (laughs) into the finest room in his palace and to be laid upon a bed all embroidered with gold and silver. One would have taken her for a little angel. She was so beautiful, for her swooning had no dim the brightness of her complexion. Her cheeks were carnation and her lips coral. It is true her eyes were shut, but she was heard to breathe softly, which which satisfies those about her that she was not bad. The king gave orders that she should let her sleep quietly till the time came for her to awake. The good fairy, who had saved her life by condemning her to sleep a hundred years, was in the kingdom at Matakin, twelve thousand leagues off, when this accident befell the princess. But she was instantly informed of it by a little dwarf who had seven leagued boats, that is, boats with which he could stride over seven leagues of ground at once. The fairy started off at once and arrived, about an hour later, in a fairy chariot drawn by dragons. The king handed her out of the chariot, and she proved everything he had done. But as she had very great foresight, she thought that when the princess should awake, she might not know what to do with herself. If she was all alone in this old palace, 
This was what she did. She touched with her wand everything in the palace except king and queen, governesses, maids of honor, ladies of the bedchamber, gentlemen, officers, stewards, cooks, undercooks, kitchen maids, guards with their porters, pages, and footmen. She likewise touched to all the horses which were there in the stables, the cart of toaster horses, the hunters and the saddle horses, the grooms, the great dogs and the outward coat and little Mopsy too, the princess Paniel, which was lying on the bed. As soon as she touched them, them they all fell asleep, not to wake again until their mistress did, that they might be ready to wait upon her when she wanted them. The very spits at the fire as full as they could hold the partridges of the peasants fell asleep, and the fire itself as well. All this was done in a moment. Fairies are not long in doing their work. And now the king and the queen, having kissed their dear child without waking her, went out of the palace and set forth orders that nobody should come near it. These orders were not necessary. For in a quarter or an hour time there grew up all around, about a park such as was waste number of trees, great and small, bushes and brambles, turning one, one within another, that neither man nor beast could pass to, so that nothing could be seen but the very top of the towers of the palace, and that too, only from afar off. Everyone knew that this was old <coughs> Vesna High. Everyone knew that this was also the work of the fairy in order that while the princess slept she had nothing to fear from the curious people. After a hundred years the son of the king, then reigning, who was of another family from that of the sleeping princess, was a hunting on the side of the country, and he asked what those towers were which he saw in the middle of a great thick wood. Everyone answered according as they had heard. Some said that it was an old haunted castle, under others that all the witches of the country held their my midnight revels there. But the common opinion was that it was an ogre dwelling, and that he carried to it all the little children he could catch, so as to, to eat them up to his leisure, without when being able to follow him, for he alone had the power to make his way through the wood. The prince did not know what to believe, and presently a very aged countryman spake to him thus. May it please your royal highness, more than fifty years since I heard from my father that there was then in this castle the most beautiful princess that was ever seen, that she must live there a hundred years, and she should be awaked by a king's son, for whom she was reserved. The young prince, on hearing this, was all on fire, he told without waiting for the matter, that he could put an end to this rare adventure, and, pushed on by love and the desire of glory, he resolved at once to look into it. As soon as he began to get near to the wood, all the great trees, the bushes and the brambles gave way of themselves to let him pass through. He walked up to the castle, castle which he saw the end of the large avenue. And you can imagine he was a good deal surprised when he saw none of these people, his people following him, because the trees closed again as soon as he had passed through them. However, he didn't kiss cease from counting, counting, continuing his way. A young prince in search of a glory is ever valiant. He came into a special outer court, and what he saw was enough to freeze him with horror. 
A fright of silence reigned over all. The image of that was everywhere. And there was nothing to be seen but what seemed to be the outstretched bodies of dead men and animals. He, however, very well knew by the rabbi faces and the pummeled noses of the porters that they were only asleep and their goblets, wherein still remained some drops of wine, showed plainly that they had fallen asleep while drinking their wine. He then crossed the court paved with marble, went up the stairs and came into the guard chamber, where guards were standing in their franks, with their muskets upon their shoulders, and snoring with their older might. He went through several rooms, full of gentlemen and ladies, some standing and others sitting. But all were asleep. He came into a gilded chamber, where he saw upon a bed, the curtains of which were all open, the most beautiful sight ever behind, beheld, a princess, who appeared to be about fifteen or sixteen years of age, and whose bright and resplendent beauty had something divine in it. He approached with trembling and admiration, and fell down upon his knees before her. Then, at the end of the enchantment was come, the princess awoke, and looking on him with eyes more tender than should have been expected of the first sight, said, Is it you, my prince? You have waited a long while. The prince shone with these words, and even much with the manner of which they were spoken, knew not know how, how to show his joy and gratitude. He assumed that, that he, he loved her better than he did himself. Their discourse were, was not very connected, but they were the better placed, for where there is much love there is little eloquence. He was more of a loss than she, and we need not wonder at it. She had had time to think of what to say to him. For it is evident, though history says nothing of it, that the good fairy, during so long a sleep, had given her very pleasant dreams. In short, they talked together for four hours, and they did said not half they had to say. In the meanwhile, all the palace had woke up with the princess, every one told upon his own business, and as they were not in love, they were ready to die of hunger. The Lady of Honor, being as sharp as said to the other folks, grew very impatient and told the princess aloud that their meal was served. The prince had the princess to rise. She was tall and very magnificently dressed, but His Royal Highness took care not to tell her that she was dressed like a, his grandmother and had a high collar. She looked not a bit less charming and beautiful for all that. They went into a great mirrored hall where they supped and were served by the officials of the prince's household. The violins and hot boys played old tunes, but they were excellent, though they had not to be played for a hundred years. And after supper, without losing any time, the Lord Almunir married them in the chapel of the castle. They had but very little sleep. The princess castle scarcely needed any, and the prince left her next morning to return into the city where his father was greatly troubled about him. The prince told him that he lost his way in the forest as he was hunting, and he had slept in the cottage of a charcoal burner, who gave him a cheese and a brown bread. The king, his father, who was a good man, believed him. But his mother could not be persu persuaded that it was true, and seeing he would okay, he went almost every day a hunting, and he was always had some excuse ready for so doing, 
though he had been out rare three or four nights together, she began to suspect that he was married, for he lived thus with the princess about two whole years, during which they had no children. The elder, a daughter, was named Dawn, and the younger, a son, a son they called Day, because he was a great deal handsomer than his sister. The queen spoke several times to her son to learn after what manner he was passing his time and told him that, it, that in this he ought in duty to satisfy her. But he'd never dare to trust her with her secret. He feared her, though he loved her, for she was of the race of the ogres, and the king married her for her, his, her worst riches alone. It was even whispered about the court that she had ogreish inclinations, and that whenever she saw little children passing by, she had all the difficulty in the world to prevent herself from falling upon him. And so the prince would never tell he, her one word. But when the king was dead, which happened about two years afterward, and he saw himself lord and the master, he openly declared his marriage, and he went in a great state to conduct his queen to the palace. They made a magnificent entry into the capital city, shredding, riding between her two children. Soon after, the king made war on Emperor Khan Talabut, his neighbor. He left the government of the kingdom of the queen, his mother, and earnestly commanded his wife and children to her care. He was obliged to carry on the war all the summer, and as she soon as soon as he left, the queen mother sent her daughter-in-law and her children to a country house among the woods, that she might with the most east gratify her horrible longing. So a few days afterward, she went to endure herself and said to her head cook, I indeed, I intend it with a little dawn of my dinner tomorrow. Oh, madam, cried the head cook. I will have it so, replied the queen. And this she spoke in the tone of an ogress who had a strong desire to eat fresh meat and will eat her with a sharp sauce. The poor man, knowing very well that he must not play tricks with the ogress, took his great knife and went up to the I don't know when I <clears throat> want to uh, to do yeah. live video with uh, this phone via via Facebook. Um, it okay. don't want to be horizontal, so I continue now without live, and I will post uh, after uh, the recording for the finishing of the fairy tale, the Sleeping Beauty. So I continue, or I I was interrupted, means um, when uh, when the little what when the <laughs> so this this kind of another version of uh, Sleeping Beauty that we are know we but we know normally uh, it because it combines. The first portion, of the first part, uh, the Sleeping Beauty, and then, like the the, the Sleeping Beauty, w which was already married with the prince, and um, the prince have had to leave uh, for for a war, so he left her 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 bride, her wife with the children. Um, to to his mother, who who was actually the ogress, so so let let's continue. Soon after, the king made a war on Emperor Cantalabut, his neighbor. 
He left the government of the kingdom to the queen, his mother, and earnestly commanded his wife and children to her care. He was obliged to care on the war all the summer, and as soon as he left, the queen mother sent her daughter-in-law and her children to a country house among the woods, that she might, she might with the more ease gratify her horrible longing. Some few days afterward, she went to tilt her hill south and said to her head cook, head cook, I intend to eat, to eat little dong for my dinner tomorrow. Oh, madam, cried the head cook. I will have it so, replied the queen. And this she spoke in the tone that the ogress who had a strong desire to eat fresh meat and would eat her with a sharp sauce. The poor man, knowing very well that he must not play tricks with the ogress, took his great knife and went up into little Dawn's chamber. She was then nearly four years old and came up to him, jumping and laughing, to put her arms around his neck and ask him for some sugared candy. Upon which he began to weep. The great knife fell out of his hand, and he went into the backyard and killed a little lamb, and dressed it with such good sauce that his mistress assured him she had never eaten anything so good in her life. He had at some time taken up his a little dawn and carried her to his wife to conceal her in her lodging at the end of the country yard, courtyard. Eight days afterwards, the wicked queen said to the chief cook, I will sup upon a little day. He answered not a word, being resolved to cheat her again, as he had done before. He went to find little day, and saw him with a foil in his hand, with which he was fencing with a great monkey. The child was then only three years of age. He took him up in his arms and carried him to his wife, that she might conceal him in her chamber along with his sister. And instead of little die, she served, he served up a young and very tender kid which the Yagras found to be wonderfully good. All had gone well up to now, but one evening his wicked queen said to his chief cook, I will eat the queen with the same sauce I had with her children. Now the poor chief cook was in despair and could not imagine how to deceive her again. The young queen was over twenty years old. Not reckoning with the hundred years she has been asleep, and how to find something to, to take her place greatly puzzled him. He then decided to save his own life, to cut the queen's throat, and going up into her chamber, with intent to do it at once, he put himself into a great fury, as he, as he possibly could, and came into the young queen's room with his dagger in his hand. He would not, however, deceive her, but told her, with a great deal of respect, the orders he had received from the queen mother. <laughs> because I want you to do take it, more pictures, because you never come in here, Stretch you don't come. Her neck. Carry out your orders, and then I shall go and see my children, my poor children, whom I love so much and so tenderly. For she taught him that, since they had been taken away without her knowledge. No, no, madam, cried the poor chief cook, all in tears. You shall not die, and you shall see your children again at once. But then you must go home with me to my longings where I have consoled them, and I will deceive the queens once more by giving her a young hen in your stead.
Upon this, he forthwith conducted her to his room, where, leaving him to embrace her children and cry out with them, he went and dressed her young hen, which he queen has no for her supper, and devoured her with as much appetite as it had been the young queen. She was now well satisfied with her cruel deeds, and she invented a story to tell to the queen as on his return, of how the queen, his wife, and her two children has been devoured by mad wolves. One evening, as she was, according to his custom, rambling around about the courts and yards of the palace to see if she could smell any fresh meat, she heard in a room of the ground floor little day crying, for his mamma was going to whip him, because he had been nothing, and she heard, at the same time, little dawn begging mercy for her brother. The ogress knew the voice of the queen and her children at once, and being furious of having been thus deceived, she gave orders in a most horrible voice which made everybody tremble that next morning by break of day they should bring into the middle of the great court a large tub filled with toads, wipers, snakers, and all sorts of serpents in order to have the queen and her children, the chief cook, his wife and maid, thrown into it, all of whom were to be brought tighter, tighter with their hands tied behind them. They were brought out accordingly, and the executioners were just going to throw them into the tub, when the king, who was not so soon expected, entered the court on her horse home back and asked, with the utmost astonishment, what was the meaning of the horrible spectacle? No one daring to tell him. When the ogress, all in rage to say what had, had happened, to herself had foremost into the two, and was instantly devoured by the ugly creatures she has ordered to be thrown into to kill the others. The king was of course very sorry for, his, for she was his mother, but he soon comforted himself with his beautiful wife and his pretty children. The version above, Sleeping Beauty in the Woods, is from Project Gutenberg. As is, as, as is usual, the most English translation of Charles Perrault tales from Mother Goose, the translator omits the moral of the story in a verse. All the tales from Mother Goose have one, the one for Little Red Riding Hood, perhaps the most engaging. Here then is the moral from La Belle of Bois Dormant, first in the original French, followed by my own loose translation in English. Moralité. Attendre quelques temps pour avoir un époux, riche, bien fait, galant et doux, la chose est assez naturelle. Mais l'attendre c'est un temps, est toujours en dormant. On ne trouve plus de femelle qui dormit si tranquillement. La fable semble encore vouloir nous faire entendre que ce vent de l'hymen les agréables nœuds pour être différés n'en sont pas moins heureux et qu'on ne perd rien pour attendre. Mais le sexe, avec tant d'ardeur, aspire à la foi conjugale que je n'ai pas la force ni le cœur de lui prêcher cette morale. To wait a while to find a, to find a husband, rich, good-looking, childbirth, chivalrous and kind, this is nature enough. But to wait a hundred years, always asleep, you can't find a girl or woman anymore who will sleep so tranquilly. The fairy tale above seems to tell us that to put all bonds of love may make the happier marriage. 
and that there is nothing to lose by waiting. But the first sex has such a passion for conjugal intimacy that I have neither the strength nor the heart to preach them that more. What the life from the morality of Perrault is the implied suggestion that there is a lot more love making going on both before and after marriage than the nominal morals of the time would allow, and his implication of willing participation in these festivities. Perrault's little verse moralities are so very modern. So I really even did not read the fairy tale, the, this, this version of fairy tale, before I was uh, starting to posting to posting in, in, in live actually. But uh, so it started all this, this spot is started from a feeling that I have now. On the, on the streets, which are actually quite dead, and of something that is happening, something, some fear of death also, which is quite, uh, which is quite present now. So, I will finish the post and uh, if you have some something to to say to say to to comment or to to start conver conversation just please go ahead and I'm just starting all this process so I don't know really where we will go to which it, to what it will go but we'll, we will construct it all together. So I will do just some implications, some starting points, and then we, we will evolve together uh, to there that where also you have intention to, to be.